It is my pleasure today to introduce you to this morning's speaker. Tammy Lee is CEO and founder of Xena Ventures, a company that raises capital and provides financing to acquire intellectual property and patent licenses for medical health and wellness products. Prior to that, she was CEO of Recombinetics, a vice president of corporate and, and vice president of corporate affairs at Carlson Inc., as well as Delta Airlines. Lee was named one of the Twin Cities Business 100 People to Know in 2019 as an emerging leader. She is also a member of the Women Presidents Organization, Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable, and Women's Forum of Minnesota. Other interests include travel, tennis, and talking with strangers. In today's presentation, Adventures in Startup Wonderland, Lee will share lessons learned from her career journey, from helping to restructure big global businesses to stabling and recapitalizing promising med tech startups. Please join me today in welcoming Tammy Lee. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you for joining me for breakfast today on this beautiful day. Um, so today I'm going to kind of take you through my story of Startup Wonderland and uh, how I grew from a small girl in Kensington, Minnesota to where I am today as CEO of a med tech company. But from the time I was a little girl, I loved female heroines. So today I'm going to take you on a journey that explains my life story inspired by Lewis Carroll's classic tale of Alice in Wonderland. she imagined, never imagined, could ever exist. And that's kind of how I ended up in med tech. It begins with Alice saying to the there's no use trying, one can't believe impossible things. The queen replies to Alice, I dare say you haven't had much. Why, when I was your age, I saw as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So today at breakfast on February 6th, we're gonna talk about the six impossible pathways that led me to being CEO of Xena Ventures. Lesson number one begins with Alice asking for directions from the Cheshire cat. And Alice says to the cat, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat replies, well that depends a good deal on where you want to go. So I grew up in a really small town of Kensington, Minnesota. Does anybody in the room know where Kensington is or has ever heard of it? Oh good, one person, you probably visited the Kensington Ruinstone. It's very famous, it's our only tourism attraction there and everybody in Kensington believes it's real and I do too, so I hope you do as well, Chuck. <laughs> so um, I wasn't exactly sure of how to get to where I was going from Kensington because Kensington is a really small town of only about three but from the time I was about 10 years old, I knew I wanted to move out into the bigger world to a more diverse, more inclusive uh, place where women could really have their own careers and be in the spotlight. Um, but in Kensington, we only had three TV channels when I was growing up. And I remember watching Jane Pauley on the Today Show and later Katie Couric and thinking I wanted to be like those women when I grew up. And I wanted to live in Washington, D.C., but I had no idea of how to get there. My mom and dad were both product great technical education, um, like many who have matriculated through the hallways here at Woody. My dad went to Alec Tech to become an electrician. Um, and when I was in college, he actually took a job at Wadena Tech teaching in the construction electrician program. My brother got his line worker degree at Tech, and my mom also got her nursing influences uh, growing up. But to get to where my parents were going, they too had to go through a lot of rabbit holes along the way. They had me very young. In fact, um, they were married their senior year of high school. And so in their high school graduation photo, they're in their caps and gowns with me in the middle of them in their graduation cake. So you can imagine what a difficult time they had starting out in life, trying to be young parents and trying to start careers of their own. But despite their fast thrust into adulthood, they raised us with really good lessons and modeled a great work ethic for my three siblings and me. They encouraged us to raise our hand in class, to always participate, to volunteer. Um, so I raised my hand a lot, and I was in things like speech and debate and drama in Kensington. And I was a volleyball captain and in band and choir, not because I was so talented at everything, but in a small town like that, everybody has to be in everything, or you don't have enough people for the team. So I did okay in Kensington. I graduated in the top 10 of my class, class of 34, so super smart. 
<laughs> and uh, went on to Concordia College from there, uh, which was my first big entree into the world. And Concordia College in Moorhead, I know there's another Concordia down here, but I went to Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, and I wanted to be a TV journalist. So I majored in political science and journalism. And for my work study job, I worked at the Concordia TV Center and I anchored the college TV news program, and I got to intern at the NBC affiliate on the weekends. My first weekend as a reporter, the, the real weekend reporter called in sick. So much to my delight, I got my first big break in news. I got to cover the junior league rummage sale. Can you imagine my catapult to stardom from there? And because I did such a great job, I got to cover Moorhead City Hall, which meant I was finally covering news and politics the way that I wanted to. So it wasn't exactly the Oval Office, but I was on my pathway to finding out to where I wanted to get in TV news. And after um, my junior year of college, I, I actually got an internship done at what would become the very first startup that I worked at, NBC News. It was the news channel in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they produced the uh, NBC Night Side and worked for all the affiliate news stations. So that was my first job in television. And then after a couple hops later, I ended up in Washington, D.C. And while working as a field producer for Hubbard's news broadcasting service, I got to cover the White House and Capitol Hill, and then was hired as a breaking news producer for Fox News Channel. And Fox News was a brand new startup at that time, so that's my second startup, NBC News Channel in Charlotte, and then Fox News Channel in Washington, D.C., um, both startup news affiliates. But that brings me to my second lesson. If it's not your cup of tea, find a new party. So Fox wasn't exactly my cup of tea, um, but it gave me some great experiences, and like Alice, it opened the new door to the future. Because when I was a Fox News producer, I got to travel to the Democratic National Convention and interview senators. And one of the senators that I interviewed was Senator Byron Dorgan from North Dakota. First of all, I couldn't believe he did the interview because he's a Democrat. Um, and second of all, um, we had a very great conversation after the, the interview, and I thanked him for doing it. I told him that my mom grew up in North Dakota, that I went to Concordia College, and uh, it was a very polite conversation that I didn't expect would, would go much further from there. But the next Monday, his chief of staff called and asked if I wanted to come work for him as his press secretary. So Fox News, coincidentally, ended up landing me working for a Democratic senator, which is a crazy part of the rabbit hole story of my life. So I found a new party and a new purpose, but I quickly learned the lessons of Capitol Hill as stated by the mock turtle from Alice in Wonderland. Reeling, writhing, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. It sounds like this week in Washington, <laughs> the impeachment trial, the State of the Union, and then the Iowa caucus debacle. So not much has changed in the last 20 years since I left Washington, D.C. But in my early 20s, I really believed that public service was the way that you could change the world, and I still believe that to be true. There are a lot of great public servants who give their time and talents in both parties to make sure that democracy can work. Um, so I was really hooked on politics, and I was using my poli-sci degree and my journalism degree, working for Senator Dorgan as his press secretary, and I got totally hooked on politics. So I decided I actually wanted to work on a campaign. So in 1998, I moved back to Minnesota and worked on Skip Humphrey's campaign for governor. That was the year that he ran against Jesse Ventura. And you know how that turned out. So in a three-way race, he and the Republican candidate lost to Jesse. So now unemployed, I actually started my first business, which is a public affairs consulting firm with somebody that I'd worked on the, on the campaign, which led me to my pathway in the airline industry. Another door opened because Skip lost the campaign, just like the doors always seem to open for Alice. Um, that business was actually pretty short-lived because one of our clients at the time, Sun Country Airlines, was also in startup mode, moving into scheduled service, so they, they needed somebody to come in and, and build their public affairs program. So that was now my third startup. Um, I worked my way up to VP of Marketing and Corporate Affairs, and my career in the airline industry was really taking off. And then 9-11 happened, and we all know it happened after September 11th uh, to the airline industry and to our country in general. Sun Country was already in a very unstable place, and so they became the first airline to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And uh, while it was a very difficult time, we had to furlough 1,500 employees. 
uh, we were able to keep the airline alive to sell it to new ownership and restructure it. So that was the first experience that I had in restructuring a company. And that experience got me um, the job at US Airways. Because I had bankruptcy experience, US Airways was the next airline going through Chapter 11. So I went from Sun Country to Chapter 11, or to US Airways. Out in US Airways, I was their federal director of uh, government affairs. So I worked out there for them. And then in 2003, I decided to move back to Minnesota for the ultimate startup which is starting a new family. I have my daughter, Lissa, in 2003, and she got off to a bit of a rough start. She was 27 and a half weeks, born a very premature, two pounds, six ounces, but now she's doing great. And so when I talk about all the things that I've started in life, starting a family is number one for me. So um, by the time Lissa was two years old, I began to think that very few things were impossible. I'd been part of two airline restructurings, um, and I thought that I could do a lot of things that, that other people might not be willing to try. So that brought me to lesson number three, that very few things are impossible, except for those that are. And for me, running for Congress uh, as an independent, which was a startup party, was the impossible quest. I ran a great campaign. I've tied with the Republican uh, in the district. I ran in the 5th District against Keith Ellison. So you know that the, the numbers for Democrats are, are pretty well stacked. It's about a 72% DFL index. But I thought that the Independence Party might have some promise still, because it still was a startup. But at the end of the day, I wasn't able to prevail in that campaign. So you probably wonder why I would stand up in front of you and talk about a loss or a failure when we're talking about unbelievable things that are truly possible. Because it taught me an important lesson, which was what the Duchess said to Alice. Everything's got a moral if only you can find it. And for me, the moral of that campaign was how you lose matters as much as how you win. So while I did not win that race, um, I ran a good campaign, and the week after my election, the CEO of Northwest Airlines called me, Doug Steenland, and that's how I ended up at Northwest. So one door opened another. Um, sometimes when you lose something, uh, there's an opportunity to win in a different way. So because I ran a good campaign, I ended up at Northwest Airlines which really was my dream job. And I loved working at Northwest. Um, and I was there for about seven weeks in my dream job when we decided to begin merger talks with Delta. So I'm beginning to think that I have a rain cloud over my head. Every time I try something, something happens where I'm out of my dream job. Um, but there's lessons in all of that, too. Um, as Alice said to the caterpillar, one doesn't like changing so often, you know. And the caterpillar says back to her, well, you'll get used to it in time. And I got used to that change very quickly because I knew at the end of the merger there would be a great opportunity to take that skill set into a new arena. So I did. Um, I knew I was going to have to change jobs post-merger, um, but that experience gave me another great insight into all things that are possible if you're willing to take a risk. So um, that experience was transformative, which brings me to lesson four, which all caterpillars understand. You can't become a butterfly without being a caterpillar first. So my next transformation or metamorphosis was going to the University of Minnesota, where I met several people who are in this room, Marcy Cheeseman, Don Fish, others who are here, um, that I had the opportunity to work at the University of Minnesota in their development department. So I ran corporate and foundation relations. And the University of Minnesota is a very big, slow-moving boat. But even in large organizations, my message is that you can find opportunities to run your own little startup within a large organization. So at the University of Minnesota, I was a person who was leading our global food initiative, which was a brand new initiative to pull together the best research across the university and put it together in a package where we could go out and raise big money from the Gates Foundation, Cargill, General Mills, and other companies. And today, that startup initiative, the Global Food Initiative, became one of the president's uh, signature initiatives for MinDrive and still is one of the priorities at the University of Minnesota today. So from the U, I got recruited to Carlson Companies, which is the largest privately held hospitality company in the United States. And Kirk Carlson and Gold Bond Stamps are a great example of Minnesota's best startup stories. 
Carlson is in that elite class with Cargill, General Mills, and other giants who had their humble beginnings here, family-owned businesses, family-owned companies. But with the third and fourth generations no longer involved in the business, they were far beyond that startup mentality. So by the time I arrived, Carlson had gone from a holding company of about 10 brands down to three. Um, I was hired by the CEO, uh, Hubert Jolie, who left two weeks later. Again, my good fortune and timing. <laughs> I, <laughs> again, I'm feeling like the, the kid with the rain cloud over my head. But, but it was a great time to be there because they were about to go into a restructuring. So I was part of the team that got to restructure and sell off the restaurant div division. And then also part of the team that got the hotels up and ready for sale. But like the Queen said, after most restructurings, uh, either you or your head must be off. And so I was off to my new adventure after that restructuring experience. Um, I bought a boat named Severance. And I invested in a startup brewery named Udapils. So if any of you have ever been um, to Udapils or looking for a good beer, I'm putting in a plug right now for one of my other startups, Udapils Brewing. So um, that was a great opportunity. I took the summer off then, played on my boat, and uh, trained for a triathlon. Um, and then was looking for my new opportunity, um, which is lesson number five. It came out of the, uh, the, the, um, my belief that you need to make good friends along your journey and keep them close. After the Carlson experience, um, I was recruited by Spencer Stewart to, uh, to um, be one of the three candidates for the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport job. And when I didn't get that job, a friend of mine who was working for Recombinetics said, why don't you come here and work with us? And so because of my friend Andrew, who I'd met 10 years earlier at a 40 under 40 reception, I ended up at Recombinetics as their uh, number two position, the chief administrative officer. After about a year, um, the board promoted me to CEO, which sounds really great, but my first day on the job, uh, they were out of money, so I wired in $160,000 for payroll, welcome to the role of CEO, which happens a lot of time in startup companies, and then set about to raise capital. So while I was there, we were able to raise $34 million and turn that company around. So that was probably the greatest startup success story so far of my career, and I hope it's not the very last one. So today, I'm the founder of Xena Ventures, and as you heard, we license promising technologies into the company and then help bring those commercial opportunities to light. We just opened up a new plant in Red Wing on Monday. Um, the machines are just beginning to run. I've got a friend from Red Wing here. Um, so uh, we're, we are in the business now of manufacturing and marketing therapeutic products for, for cold therapies as well as heat products around uh, uh, for um, inflammation, diabetes, addiction, uh, a variety of different things for metabolic issues and diseases. Which brings me to lesson number six along my journey. Um, oh, sorry, first the verdict, then the troll. That was a story of me becoming CEO of Recombinetics. And then uh, you must all be mad or you wouldn't come here. So for uh, how many of you are entrepreneurs in the room who have started your own company? I bet Chuck has. Yeah. Okay, a lot of entrepreneurs, yeah, and at this table, this table of women here up in front of me, all own their own businesses. They're friends of mine who I've met along the way, who are running successful, amazing companies of their own. So if you think my story is interesting, you should talk to these ladies after the program today. But being an entrepreneur is truly a lesson in madness, and especially as a female CEO, like the women at that table and me, there are still some really maddening statistics about trying to make it in the world as a CEO and raise capital. A 2018 study conducted by the Healthcare Business Women's Association reported that in life sciences companies, women hold just 17% of senior management roles and only 34% of middle management positions. Not a single female CEO serves as CEO of a Fortune 500 healthcare company, and only 22% of those board members are women. And when I was CEO at Recombinetics, I attended the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Investment Conference in January of 2018. There were more men named Michael at the conference than female CEOs. <laughs> so we've still got a ways to go. But today's message is about representing what is possible, not what's impossible. And even though only 2% of all venture capital goes to women-owned, women-led companies, I'm here to help support the other 98%. So now as CEO of my own company, Xenotherapies, we're bringing cool therapy products to market. 
under the Xenotherapies brand. Onyx Orthopedics are cool therapeutics using phase change materials that pull heat and inflammation away from injured areas. We've sold our products into Mayo Clinic and other hospital systems around the country. Um, Opal are cool products for hot women. And by hot women, I literally mean hot women, women going through menopause. So if you look at the word opal, O-P-A are the middle three letters of menopause. So opal, cool products for hot women, is that brand. We've got menopause vests. We've got some bra inserts that we call gal pals. And you can imagine how fun it was trying to name that product. You probably could come up with 20 other funny names, and we did too. But I have to be able to stand on stage and say gal pals. And then we've got a cooling vest for women who are suffering from menopause. And these products have been really successful. So these are some of the products under Onyx Ortho that, and the, the audiences that we cater to. Um, besides the vest and gal pals, we have a chill mask. And we're working on a product for women who are suffering for M from MS, also a cooling vest that we're looking for a partner to do a clinical study with. And then under the orthopedic brand, we've got one that's a bit of an outlier. We've been doing some R&D around a cool seat for uh, men who are uh, part of couples that are experiencing infertility. And by sitting on this cool seat an hour in the morning and an hour at night, there was a 20% increase in sperm motility. So it's a product that is low-tech, non-invasive, non-pharmacological, and works well. And all of these products are in that category of being non-pharmacological. The chill wrap, you wear it over your clothing, it's non-invasive. All of these products um, do not require a prescription, but you can use your HSA and flex spend money to purchase them. So uh, when we did our clinical study, uh, we did it with uh, the first group of women. We got another group of 50 women in a trial right now. After four weeks of wearing the menopause vest, 70% of our patients had a 75% reduction in the number of hot flashes. So these products really work well. It's a big addressable market, over a $3 billion marketplace for women who are going through menopause. And every day, 5,000 new women enter the market. So we believe we've got a lot of opportunity here. So the other product line that we have is Warms. These are infrared heat and light cocoon pods. And we've been doing some research around various metabolic diseases. They've been used for wellness and fitness applications. But we're looking for clinical studies around uh, neurodegenerative effects, addiction, diabetes, um, and a variety of other clinical studies where we can move these products into class two medical claims and, and sell into that arena. So that's the other business line that we're working on right now. So back to the portfolio. This is the portfolio of companies that I now represent. And it's been a long and winding road to get here from Startup Wonderland, starting at NBC News Channel in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, having my own public affairs firm that led me to Sun Country Airlines, where we started up that carrier's scheduled service, to then Fox News Channel in Washington, DC, which was a startup at the time. Then to Recombinetics, where we were growing human cells, organs, and tissues in a pig, which we call them oinkybaters. So another fun company that I work for. And now Xenotherapies. So it's been a winding road down the rabbit hole. But today, I can tell you I wouldn't change a thing. And no wise fish, as the mock turtle said, would go anywhere without a purpose. So I want to close the story with my startup wonderland by sharing my personal purpose. First of all, I've always been committed to helping advance women in their careers. I always say yes to a networking meeting with a woman, and some good men too, occasionally. But I always pick up the tab on a networking meeting with a woman because we've got to help that other 98% who aren't getting funded. I wanted to take what I learned from running for Congress when I ran and lost, and I served on the board of Women Winning, which helps select female candidates to all levels of office. I invest in women-owned, women-led funds. Sarah Rustic in Capita 3, I'm proud to be one, in, one of her fund investors. I also invested in The Coven, which is a co-working space, and I'm an investor in, in uh, Sophia 2, which is another fund focused on women-owned companies. So I put my money and my profits and my passion where my mouth is. And I encourage all of you to follow your passions and purpose through Startup Wonderland or wherever your journey may take you. Because it's not that scary. As Alice said, the Red Queen was really just a little kitten after all when she awoke from her dream. And uh, in closing, life is it, what is it but a dream. So go ahead and follow yours. And thank you for hearing the story of mine today.
questions for Tammy? We've got a little bit of time here. Well, uh, Xena Ventures has four companies that we're trying to launch right now. Um, we're looking to acquire other technologies and bring them into the portfolio. So I just came back from the Brightwood Capital Investment Conference, and there are a lot of promising technologies out there around menopause. To the men in the room, I'm sorry if this makes you uncomfortable. Last year was called the year of the period. This year is called the year of menopause. So there are a lot of products and services coming to the marketplace. We'd like to license in other health and beauty and wellness products into the menopause product line, the Opal line, and help launch other female startup companies too. With the WARMS technology, the infrared heat and light uh, sauna therapies, we're looking for clinical study, clinical study partners who want to do uh, some clinical trials with us around uh, cognitive loss, around on addiction, diabetes, other metabolic issues, um, including obesity. Chuck. In, in your company, do you like to stay friends? Do you like to go public? Um, well, I, I've never. That's one thing I haven't done. I've never taken a company public. I think with the companies and the brands that we have, our best exit strategy is an acquisition strategy. So I could see one of the big brands that are, especially those that are focused around uh, women's health and femtech right now, wanting to acquire our product lines and take on those technologies. I don't see us ever going through uh, an IPO. I think we would be great targets for strategic buyers and investors. And the next. So I raised this capital on my own to launch this company. The next will probably be a Series A round of around $10 million to, to scale one of these product lines and then do that on a serial fashion. Sarah. Yeah, so you have um, a really interesting journey. Thanks. You have a really interesting journey, and you've gone from industry to industry, you know, TV to politics to travel to airlines um, and now to to women's health and you re really seem undaunted <laughs> by changing industry can you talk a little bit about what gives you the confidence to be able to, to 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 move outside of what most of us would say a comfort zone of growing an expertise in an industry what gives you that confidence to expand well thank you Sarah um, I I just like, I, I, all of these things are things that seemed interesting to do. I've always uh, raised my hand and said yes to exciting opportunities. And if you've done a restructuring, if you've raised capital, all of these are really transferable skills. What I had to learn was a subject matter. So I didn't know science when I went to Recombinetics. And I had to learn all about gene editing. I hadn't had a science class since 10th grade biology. And at Concordia, I could fulfill that requirement with environmental studies. So not exactly a science whiz. But I think what gave me the confidence there and in other companies that I've been in is I, I bring in really great expertise around me. So I convinced somebody who was on the board of directors and had a PhD in biochemistry who had run global R&D for Tyson Foods and Colgate Palmolive to step into the number two role and, and be my science guy. So he and I together were able to raise the $34 million. So I think I have the confidence because I know what I don't know. And I fill in my gaps with other people who, who have a skill set that I don't have. And I think together, um, more minds make more success. So just an extension from that question, has there been an opportunity that you have not taken? Hmm. Um, when I left Recombinetics uh, and was looking for the next role, there were several opportunities that came up um, that were in smaller startups or companies that, that needed more time and focus on growth that were a little less mature that I decided not to do. So I think for the companies now, my, my investment thesis or my own personal thesis of companies that I want to run need to be a little bit more mature on the product line where they've already got a good idea. They just need to build market share and bring that product into commercialization. I would say I'm less of an inventor and innovator and IP creator than uh, a market maker. And so I think that's, that's my talent in helping bring other people's bright ideas to market. And I think that's how I see my company growing and me continuing to grow on this journey. Journey. 
Tammy, given your extensive um, experience with startups, what advice might you have for students who are sitting here today who have a really good idea and they may want to grow that into their own business someday? Yeah, um, well, there are a lot of great wraparound services that help you get launched. So Sarah Rusick has Capita 3, which really focuses on women entrepreneurs and provides a boot camp for them to do everything they need to to get their business idea to market. Grow North Labs and others, uh, Greater MSP is partnering around bringing new companies and technologies to the marketplace. So there are a lot of fantastic organizations here in the Twin Cities that will help launch these companies. And then just asking people who have done it before or myself, any of the women at this table have been out either raising capital or talk to people that have been. And so um, finding those resources. But I will tell you one great thing that's happening, because everybody was trying to do this on their own in a really fragmented way for such a long time, uh, Greater MSP has this online portal that you can now go to and click on your industry, click on the type of business, and they'll provide you with some of those resources and organizations that can give you that support. Tammy, as I listened to you talk, you were able to shift your what could have been seen as a negative or unfortunate to something that like it's a new opportunity or something you can take with it. Is there any tips that you have used to help yourself shift your thinking to see that way? Well, I don't know. You probably remember this. You, we grew up about the same time. There was um, a toy called Weebles. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. And they get knocked down, and they get back up again. And I think when you've gone through changes like this, you have to be very uh, resilient. And um, it's part of my life's kind of motto and mission. So on my wrist, I have this tattoo, which is Chinese, in honor of my daughter, who speaks fluent Chinese and has had a rough start, and this is persist. So every time I'm thinking about, can I do this again, or how am I going to get through there, I think about just continuing to persist. And through every uh, dark day or difficulty, you only have one choice. You can only go forward. And so the only way th over is through, and that's my personal mantra. And I think out of any opportunity, like I set up here, how you lose matters as much as how you win. There's an opportunity to gain some great insight out of that. There's nothing that I've been that I've ever done that I've said, well, that that was a complete bust. I wish I wouldn't have done that because I think I've been able to take some lesson from it. Kimmy over My here. friend. Oh, sorry. I, I, Ruth, Ruth has a quick question here. She's been trying to jump in. Ruth was one of my early campaign supporters when I was running for Congress, which was a big deal for Ruth to do because she's a well-known uh, Democrat, great funder, great friend of Democratic candidates. And Ruth took a personal risk by coming over to support me. My pleasure. My question is, would you ever go back into politics? Oh, I know that you may say that. <laughs> Well, obviously, I think I'm better at running companies and running for office, I'll say that. Clearly, by the, the electorate probably agrees, too. My challenge is, Ruth, and as you know why I ran as an independent, is because I'm, I'm very uh, pro-social issues, pro-choice, pro-woman, pro-environment, but also uh, pro-business. I've got to, you know, I believe in creating strong businesses, strong economies, and it's tough. To, you, you can't get elected in either of the two current parties today with that position. We see that uh, in the Iowa caucuses, the, the moderates are having a difficult time. Um, Amy's campaign is having a, a difficult time right now. Um, so I feel like we've got to go through another um, inflection point before the country might be ready to pull back to the middle. And maybe after I make I, all these women at the table I've talked to, um, except for Shannon wasn't part of this conversation, but she could be there too. I, I just want to be part of creating uh, unicorn companies. It's my spirit animal, the unicorn. Because unicorns are companies that are billion dollar privately held companies. And I think if we can continue to grow those, that will really grow the economy. And I'll just put my money to work electing other good candidates. When I have a billion dollars, when I have a billion dollars, I'll do the Bloomberg thing and I'll run again. <laughs> Tammy, thanks so much for your shout out for Grow North and Greater MSP. I have to give a shout out for the Minnesota Cup. So for all of you who are thinking about getting started with the business, applications will open in the latter part of March. So keep your eyes out for the Minnesota Cup business plan competition. Thank you.
Thanks, Paul. My, my question is, as, as an entrepreneur, what are the skill sets that you feel need to really be focused on today that are different than what they were five, ten years ago? Yeah, so everything is about bringing great ideas to market. And so what really helped me go from having a liberal arts underpinning at Concordia College is I got an MBA at St. Thomas. It's critically important to know how to run a business. Or if you've got a great idea, then take your idea and partner with somebody who knows how to run a business. And everything now is also um, immediate digital commerce. I mean, there's still some B2B business that happens, but a lot of brands and companies rise and fall on their digital presence, particularly some of the products that we're in. Um, so if you're not digitally native, having an agency that is as well. But it's all about business um, and how you scale and how you compete for airtime or consumer mindset is, I think, more critical now than it's ever been. But if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have the business skills, you need a great CFO and you need a great board of directors, a great advisory board to help you get to where you're going. And I think that's a really critical need today. We, so, yes, Tim, you've got a phenomenal story and um, I really appreciate the diversity of your background. You've done so many different things. Um, as students are going forward, what suggestions would you have for them about how they discern which parts of their story they tell in which environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, as you can see, I don't shy away from the bad things because I think it makes you more authentic and say who you are. And I've learned more from the things in life that have gone wrong than the things in life that have gone right. Recombinetics was an incredibly difficult journey. Uh, I probably did, I don't know, 70 to 100 investor pitches before we got to the 34 million that we needed. So you get knocked down a lot before you have that win to talk about. And I tell people when I've fallen down and the things that didn't work because it makes you more human to an employer. I would rather hire somebody who failed three times and trying to get their idea to market than somebody who got really lucky right out of the gates. So I, I think resiliency builds character. And so I would say just be honest about your journey. I'll, of course, highlight the good things that you've done, but, but it's OK to, to, to share your lessons learned. Yep. Um, you talked about the things you feel you have that helped you um, move from one industry to the other. What did, um, obviously, you had people that saw things in you to move, to bring you into a company that you had no background, and that happened repeatedly. Mm -hmm. What do you think people see in you? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the greatest thing growing up was the, the communication skill. When I was, um, my daughter was 10 years old, and she was sitting at a table with my siblings, who two of them are really smart in science and math. And Lisa, my daughter, is really smart in science and math. Her brain is wired that way. And she said to my brother Travis and my sister Trisha, we are all so lucky. Poor mommy, her only talent is communications. <laughs> so, so I've had to use my only talent to tell the story of what has worked for me. And I think I've been able to talk my way into situations and companies that most, when I got hired at Northwest, I did not have the resume to come in as a corporate officer. When I got hired at Recombinetics, no science background, but I'd done restructuring. So I was able to take the pieces of my resume and my skill set that worked and try and highlight that as the areas of focus. And then also being really upfront about what I, what I don't know and how I was going to fill in the gaps. So I think the ability to do storytelling um, and to, to create your own narrative is why I've been able to go into roles that I never deserved to be in. Well, thank you, Tammy, for thank your you. message, and thank you for spending time with us today. What I'd like to do is let you know about our next Jackson Leadership uh, lecture, and that is uh, Matt Furman on March 5th. He's the Chief Communications and Public Affairs Office for Best Buy Company, and, if, uh, and he'll follow your great message, Tammy. So thanks for being here, everybody. And again, March 5th, Matt Furman, Communications Officer and Public Affairs Officer for Best Buy, will be here. Thanks, everybody.